Bonjour. Welcome to Wasa Distance Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN 3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I'm the teacher, Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the Wasa Studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM and also on the television at Bell Express View channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available both from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled Monday through Thursday from 10 to 11 in the morning, and we are in our eighth week of our nine week course. As we are just about to wrap up our course, you definitely should be submitting work for marking at this point. A reminder that the key questions are listed at the end of each of your IL lessons. You need to do all of them. Some are check your understanding questions, some are activities, and some are review questions. So explain your ideas and your thoughts in complete sentences and make sure you're actually answering the question. You can do this by hand or electronically. If you are going to do it by hand, you can write it right in your workbook, though the spaces are really small, so I'd encourage you to write your answers that you're handling in on a separate piece of paper. And you can also, if you're going to do it electronically, PDF, Word, and Google Doc files are the easiest for us to open. Everyone has access to Google Doc through their NNEC email address. If you need help learning how to do that, let me know, and I'm happy to walk you through how to do that. So how do you actually submit your work for marking? Well, there's three methods. The first is to send your work in electronically. You can scan your completed work through a device. If you have an Apple device using the Notes app, which is free and comes generally with other devices, has, it has a scan function and the Android devices, the Google Drive app, which also is free and generally comes with those devices, it has a scan function. If you're not trying to do that, on my YouTube channel, there is a there's videos to link how to do that. Um, so to show you how to do that. So feel free to check that out. Then you can send it to email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca. And you want to CC it to John. I am no longer marking for this course. I'm only instructing uh, during these last few weeks. So term 1A, I am teaching this course. But outside of that time, John is responsible for this course and he is marking it right now. So his email address is jstradiotto at nnec.on.ca. So send him your work directly to him if you want to email it. Then you can also drop it off into Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street. We're the bright red building next to the post office, and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. The third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you want to connect with me through social media, even though I am not marking, I am still available to connect with you about our course material. Both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can find me there and friend me or subscribe if you'd like. All of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and uploaded to YouTube shortly after airing. I put them under a playlist called SVN3E. So this is a really easy way of finding all of our recordings if you want to go back and look at past material. Also, there is a playlist called supplementary videos under the SVN3E playlist, um, where all of our videos that we've watched in class that are available on YouTube are linked there. So you can find them from the original sources if you'd like. Science is a really visual subject. I incorporate as many videos, diagrams, charts, graphs, whatever I can to connect to our concepts. So I strongly encourage you to access the videos, either joining me live through the Zoom link. You don't have to talk to me. You can just sit and watch. That's totally fine. Or watching the YouTube videos is really going to set you up for the most success. If you don't have access to reliable internet, which totally is understandable, it can be challenging. 
let me know and I'm happy to send you a copy of the recordings to you so that you can get the full experience. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us here at WASA. You can connect with me directly if you'd like. My email address is bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can reach out to me through Facebook at bslatewasa. If you want to connect with John directly about marking, his email address is J-S-T-R-A-D-I-O-T-T-O at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can call us both at the office. Our local number is 807-737-1488. And you can also call us toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My extension is 2209 and John's extension is 2210 if you wanna get a hold of him directly. I believe it's important to position myself within the context of my educational experience to help be accountable to how my understanding of education shapes how I teach. So I have white settler ancestry, I have white privilege, and this shapes how I have experienced education. It has made education easier and have less barriers to me because I am white. This means that also I uh, get trapped in the belief system that the white way, the way that I learned is the way, is the only perspective of methods and pedagogy and concepts when teaching. I work to disrupt this and I try to learn outside of the bubble that I grew up with, but it is something that is a process and active work that I'm doing and I don't always get it right. I do live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. And this is a culture and people that I am working to learn from in order to integrate teachings and perspectives into our science courses. As an educator, I have lots to learn and unlearn. Again, this is a lifelong journey. This isn't something that I can just check off and say, I'm good, I've got it all figured out. No, um, I'm constantly happy to take feedback and to, I welcome critiques, though I recognize that that is emotional labor and time that not everyone has or is willing to uh, bequeath upon me, which is completely understandable. Also our textbook I've realized is Eurocentric. It positions the white experience and white communities as the primary experience. Uh, it ignores indigenous Inuit and Métis knowledges and experiences. I try to counter this by integrating as much as I can into our course, though this isn't something I have completely figured out. Hopefully WASA will continue to try to figure out a better resource, but as I'm shortly no longer responsible for this course. It's not gonna be within the scope of my abilities. Um, but if it's something that you're concerned about, please let us know and we, hearing it from students will more likely push us to do better. All right, we are in unit seven. We are in the end, right at the end of our course, we have our last lessons this week and then the rest of our time we'll be reviewing um, to make sure that you're set up for your final projects and assessments. So unit seven is about using natural resources with sustainable practices. So this little blurb comes from your textbook. It says, you may have heard of the right to free speech, but have you heard of the right to water? Organizations like the United Nations argue that access to clean water should be a human right protected in international law. The United Nations has estimated that each person on earth needs 20 to 50 liters of water a day to meet their basic needs. Yet over 1.1 billion people lack access to an adequate supply of water. You may be one of them. We've already talked about how folks in indigenous communities, in First Nation communities in our area do not have access to clean, healthy water. This is not okay. Earth's water is under threat from human-made pollution and large corporations that buy up water reserves for profit. Right to water activists argue that countries with abundant fresh water, like Canada, should share their water and not sell it. Also, should we should have access, so this is why you should not be having to buy bottled water. Um, the United Nations and activists are arguing um, you should be able to have access to clean, free, accessible water. 
Um, this should be a human right. We all need it to survive. You should have, you should be able to have it. So this is the kind of things that we're going to be looking at over the next the last few lessons. Today we're focusing on lesson 21, which is looking at Canada's natural resources. So our learning goals are that at the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify and describe several natural resources in Canada. You will understand which are renewable and non-renewable and why. You know that you've met the learning goals because you can explain the economic benefits of both renewable and non-renewable natural resources. And you can think critically about sustainable use of natural resources. So first, let's look at what renewable natural resources are within Canada. It's important to recognize that a resource can only be called renewable if it is being replaced by natural processes faster than it is being consumed. So just because it's replenishable, if we are using it up faster than it can be consumed, does not then it's not renewable because we're going to use it all up and then it can't replenish itself. So we have to be able, we have to be using it sustainably in a way that it can renew itself naturally. So we're going to look at Canadian fisheries as one example. Canada's coastline is 29,000 kilometers long and it has lakes and rivers that contain more than half of the world's fresh water. Canada contains more than half of the world's fresh water. This is super important to realize. Two of Earth's richest fishing grounds are also located off Canada's east coast, leading to Canada being the top in the top 20 international fish, fish exporters. In addition to catching fish from oceans, rivers, and lakes, Canadians operate over 640 aquaculture businesses or fish farms, raising salmon, trout, mussels, and oysters. So fisheries are a big part of our economy, but again, we need to be doing this. Fish can totally be a renewable resource. They can repopulate themselves quickly and without too much time or trouble, but only if we are fishing responsibly and sustainably. So looking at some statistics about Canadian fisheries in the last few years. The, on the West Coast fisheries, so generally uh, in BC is that coastline, the top three commercially fished species are Pacific salmon, crab, and hawk. And they are about in terms of value, in terms of how much money we make, 91 hundred and ninety five thousand dollars are so that's over 91 million dollars of profit for pacific salmon for over 63 million dollars for crab and over 63 million dollars for hockey and we generally export them to pacific salmon to the united states is the largest one to china for crab and Surprisingly enough, Ukraine for hockey isn't something that I would know. Um, but there you go. Ukraine likes our fish. So then freshwater fisheries. So within the uh, interior of Canada, so Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario primarily, uh, you can see on this map, it says that closed fishery. So Alberta is not does not have open fisheries right now. Um, and then also the Northwest Territories are, do have fisheries. So yellow pickerel, whitefish, and rock bass. And yellow pickerel is over $38 million. Whitefish is over $13 million. And rock bass is over $2 million. Um, so a lot of this goes to the United States is the top export market for all three of these types of fish. And then our East Coast fisheries are uh, lobster. So this is in Quebec and the Atlantic provinces, Newfoundland and Labrador, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI. So lobster is over a billion, almost $1.5 billion in 
profit for lobster. Uh, snow crab is 755 million and shrimp is 365 million. So this is a, this, that East Coast fishery is a lot of income for uh, the Canadian fishing industry. Then lobster primarily goes to uh, the United States. Snow crab goes to the United States and shrimp goes to China is where most of it goes. So just shows you sort of how much, how invested we are in Canadian fisheries, how big of an impact would have on our economy if we were not doing this sustainably. And if we were to wipe out these types of fish, they would have a huge economical impact on us. So also in addition to having a large commercial fishery, Canada has recreational and indigenous fisheries. Recreational fishery across Canada catch trout, walleye, bass, salmon, shellfish, et cetera, to eat. So you can, and you even locally, we know this, that in the summer, um, tons of people come to Sioux Lookout in our general area uh, to fish. And then some Indigenous peoples have been fishing the waters in Canada for thousands of years. They have expert knowledge of local fish and how to fish sustainably. The fish of Canada have an important role in complicated aquatic ecosystems. In order to be healthy, these ecosystems require the presence of Canada's great variety of fish species. So the fish have a really big impact on our ecosystems as a whole, as well as our economy and our industries, like tourist industries and Indigenous people uh, rely upon them in many areas where fish is essential to their ways of life and health. So the second resource that we're gonna be looking at is wildlife. So from black bears to beetles, deer to damselflies, peregrine falcons to pond weeds, Canada abounds with a variety of different animals collectively called wildlife. We've looked at this a little bit before in terms of like native species, but we're gonna just briefly look a little bit more. This wildlife attracts tourists from all over the globe who wanna catch a glimpse of a polar bear in Northern Manitoba, a pronghorn antelope in Saskatchewan, a moose in British Columbia, or perhaps a herd of doll sheep in the Yukon. So this is a big part, this concept of the natural Canadian wilderness is a big part again of our economy that brings in tourism. Wild animals and plants also provide food for many Canadians who hunt, trap, and gather them. Healthy wildlife populations provide many goods and services that some Canadians take for granted. Others, such as some Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis peoples, rely on wildlife to eat and know its needs to be sustainably managed. So we're gonna watch one video that uh, just shows one indigenous hunter um, living and working in the boreal forest and how he interacts with wildlife and how it's part of his, his daily life. The Canadian boreal forest is the largest intact forest and wetlands ecosystem remaining on Earth. This is a story of someone who calls it home. When I'm out in the bush, I like the quietness the sounds of nature and the beauty and knowing that we're free. At a young age, I learned my hunting skills by observing elders. It's healthy to be out there mentally, you know, physically, and the food you harvest from the land is all natural.
My name is James Marlowe. I was born and raised in Tlutsuke, Northwest Territories. I am a member of the Tlutsuke Tena First Nation. Right now we're at the cabin which I built for my kids and my spouse to live in and to practice uh, traditional activities and are part of our culture. And we're at Duhamel Lake, a small lake, and the lake uh, contains a lot of wildlife such as moose, ducks, geese, beavers, muskrats, uh, musk oxen, and also fish. This area, I, I know like a top of my hand. I am self-supporting, uh, doing my own stuff, such as uh, taking out people, hunting, fishing, showing them our way of life, so that they have an idea how the land looks, how fresh and natural it is. And at times I create weekend events for our young people where the youth can go and the elders can teach them traditional activities so that they won't lose the knowledge of how to do it. I'm uh, teaching them how to hunt fish and trap and um, I think it's important to keep it up so that they know how to survive out on the land. Right now we're doing a moose camp and uh, we want to take kids out to hunt moose and show them how to track them and prepare the meat once it's harvest. It's a lot of work. It's not as simple as going out there shooting and bringing meat back. And once you shoot the moose, there's a system of how to properly butcher it. Now, I've always been taught that it's good to share. I would package up a little uh, package of meat and go out in the community and we give it all out. The whole community benefits. We do this as part of our tradition and at the same time, uh, this creates good luck for us, the hunters. It's important to me to uh, protect the land, the water, animals, because we depend on it for our survival. Right there, if you look out the window, there's just like a grocery store. All the animals that live on our land, you go out there and harvest them and you have healthy food. The fresh water here is fresher than the bottled water. You can go anywhere, any lake, any river. You can take a cup and just drink it. But at the moment, there's a lot of uh, development happening in our area. Uh, 1990s, there was a big diamond rush. Those mines are located right in the main migration route of the caribou. They made big holes in our land where the caribou is avoiding. And all the noise and all the dust from the mine, the caribou know that, so they're moving somewhere else. And now there's hardly any caribou. Hopefully that will go back to its normal herd someday. We want uh, the kids to have a future that they see today. In 100 years or so, we want them to live how we live. We want them to keep it that way so that they can keep their culture. And we want them to hunt, fish and trap in the future. And also teach the skills they know and pass it on to their kids. When people come to visit us, we're hoping that they come and we teach them our way of life. We want visitors to uh, go away knowing that there's uh, indigenous and First Nations people living out here in the bush, in the wilderness, that are still practicing their way of life in a clean, pristine area that has no pollution that the ancestors had provided for them. I want them to feel happy knowing that there's an area that is being protected for as long as the earth is here. So that just gives 
one story and perspective of the importance of the wildlife as this as a natural resource is so much more than just an economic resource, but connection of culture and tradition and health, food. There's so much benefit to wildlife and to our natural resources. And sometimes we can just get caught in the uh, Eurocentric perspective that this is only value in terms of uh, financial economic value. All right, so now let's look at forests. So much of Canadian surface is blanketed by forests. 5.5 million square kilometers are currently forest. This represents 10% of the world's forests and 30% of the world's boreal forests. Canadians make industrial use of this resource and Canada is now the world's largest exporter of forest products. Most of those products are sold to the United States, Asia and Europe. Here is a graph that just, or a chart that just shows the how much um, Canadian soft lumber is exported and the value of it from 2014 to 2019. Um, so worldwide in 2017, 2018, this was over, uh, this is like billions of dollars. <laughs> like it's, uh, and dramatically in 2018, 2019, it dramatically dropped, um, which there'll be, you can have a conversation, we can, we can look into more about why that has dropped so much and what the impacts are of that soft lumber in export being like a third of the amount that we usually have exported. So just understand what softwood versus hardwood is, is this language can be thrown around. Canada's forests are made up mostly of softwood trees. So these are coniferous trees, pine, spruce, hemlock, cedar are some examples. Hardwood is common in Eastern Canada. Uh, these are deciduous trees. So oak, beech, ash, maple. The term softwood and hardwood originally come from loggers based on how much the tree resists the saw blade. Um, these terms are not always accurate. Just to know that you might be a seen as a softwood tree and your wood might not actually be soft. So this map shows us the composition across Canada um, generally of the types of trees. So it's based on uh, this legend here tells us the dominant type of tree in that area. So this middle green is spruce. So much of this uh, much of Canada, most of the forests in Canada, spruce is dominant. Um, and then fir as well. Cedar, as you can see in the mountains regions and in BC, it's a little bit different. And then as you uh, come to the southern end of the forest, the we get more deciduous trees, so birch, and maple a lot of in southern Ontario but primarily and then of course there's others as well but primarily spruce is significant and pine is also um, significant in various areas as well so you just see the types of trees that are in our forests cutting down trees is not the only way Canadians use forests for economic gain the Canadian tourist industry caters to visitors who want to experience wild forested lands. So you can see in these images, some of the huge redwoods in BC, which there's, here's one person. You can just see the, how large these trees are and how here, another one, we have a, a suspension bridge, people are walking across and then just the height of these huge, huge forests, these trees. Untouched Canadian forests are also vital to wildlife biodiversity. Scientists have estimated that two thirds of all species in Canada are in some way associated with forest habitats. So a lot of our diversity is based on our lives in connection with our forests. Now we also wanna talk about water. Canada has an abundance of fresh water, both surface and groundwater that makes this an important natural resource. Almost 9% of Canada is covered by fresh water. 
remember, Canada has over half the world's freshwater access as well. Every year, Canada's rivers discharge 7% of Earth's renewable water. Canada has about 25% of the world's wetlands. 8.5 million Canadians get their drinking water from the Great Lakes, which also supports 25% of Canadian agriculture. Along with fresh waters service, fresh water, Canada's aquifers are storehouses of fresh waters. This is under the ground. Aquifers are underground beds of crumbly rock or soil from which water, groundwater can be pumped. There is more water underground in Canada than above ground. This map I found really interesting in terms of it shows the water above ground and the water below ground. So this cylinder ratio is the ratio of water use. So surface water and the uh, groundwater. So this line here in the middle cuts the ground, represents the ground, and then how much water we use, where it comes from, from the surface or from the ground. And then this graph shows us the potential annual recharge. So the amount of water available to refill local and far traveled aquifers. So the amount of water that can come from there. And is that coming from the ground or from underwater? So it's just really interesting to look at where we get our water from and then the amount that we're not tapping into. So PEI is interesting. 100% is coming from below surface, which makes sense. PEI is a very, very small uh, island surrounded by oceans. So their water's going to come, their fresh water's going to come below the surface because they don't have lakes. Um, whereas Ontario, 69% is coming from surface water because we have so many lakes. Same with Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Manitoba. Um, many of these are coming from above the ground. It's just an interesting way to think about our resources. Most Canadians rely on surface water for drinking. That's what that map shows us. However, 26% of Canadians rely on aquifers for drinking water and other purposes. P relies on aquifers for its entire water supply, which that last map showed us. Both surface and groundwater are used for other human activities in Canada, including water livestock, irrigating croplands, fish farming, and extracting minerals and fossil fuels. So now that we've looked at all those natural resources, you can do the check your quest key questions on page 174. So now let's look at non-renewable resources. Currently, without Canada's oil and gas sectors, Canada's economy would shrink by more than 50%. Similarly, Canada's may many sorry, Canada's many deposits of minerals and metals are major sources of economic wealth. Canada's non-renewable natural resources provide many economic benefits to Canada. So coal, Canada has almost 4% of the world's coal resources. 97% of Canada's coal reserves are in Western Canada. Canada exports about 28 million tons of coal per year to 21 countries, which brings in about 2 billion a year. Slowly, the world is moving away from coal as a primary energy source. This will have a dramatic effect on Canada's economy. You can think about even how Ontario no longer uses coal. So then we have oil and natural gas. Oil and natural gas and bitumen form the foundation of Canada's natural resource economy. Bitumen is a solid or thick liquid fossil fuel. Oil was first discovered in Canada in 1857 in Southern Ontario, but it did not become a major part of Canada's economy until after the Second World War. Today, there are over 30,000 oil and gas wells in Canada, both on land and at sea. Most of these wells are located on crown land, which means the province or nation administers the land and takes profits from the wells drilled. So all of this is a really colonial and problematic view of land ownership and wealth. So we consistently throughout this lesson, we're talking about money. We're talking about how financially the, these resources, the value of these resources in terms of economic wealth, in terms of what the country, the Canadian government and 
people as well, people who live in Canada, can profit from the extraction of these natural resources, both renewable and non-renewable. And this idea of crown land, the land belonging to the government, the Canadian government, and therefore the profits extracting of the land, the extraction of resources from the land being owned by the government is really, really problematic. And this colonial idea that the government, the, per, the group of people in power are the ones who own this land. Again, all of this is a Eurocentric and colonial perspective and is not an indigenous perspective and is not necessarily the most the way that we want to be choosing to value. Um, this is how your textbook sets it. It's one strong example of how your textbook is Eurocentric and how it doesn't put value on uh, the culture, the traditions, the, the health of the land in order to have a sustainable communities and environments that will support and protect and help people thrive for generations to come. So just something to sort of take with a grain of salt and to think of critically about it. So continuing on, Canada is the seventh largest oil producer in the world and one of the only a few nations that is a net exporter of oil and gas. This means we export more oil and gas than we import. Most of our oil and natural gas is exported to the US. Now let's look at mineral and metals. The mining of minerals and metals in Canada generates about $50 billion every year in exports. A mineral is a naturally occurring solid that formed as a result of geological processes. So salt, diamonds, potash are all examples. Over a hundred mining communities across Canada rely on the industry to thrive. Canadians mine, Canadian mines a variety of metals and minerals. PI is the only province slash territory that doesn't mine minerals or metals. So here you can see another graph, uh, sorry, map that shows the various places all over Canada where there's various types of mining. Um, so in Northern Ontario, we have gold, palladium, platinum, copper, zinc. This is potentially close to some of your communities. So you might know firsthand the mining that's happening in your areas. Um, in Northern Manitoba, nickel, cobalt, gold. So you can just look around everywhere. Northwest Territories, diamonds, which was referred to in the video. Uh, none of it, gold and iron, various places. In Quebec, there is a ton. So all of these, Northern Quebec, there's nickel. Then other areas, they tell you the, the locations um, and titanium, scadium, iron, nickel, iron, gold, copper, zinc, diamonds, all of these even in Southern Ontario and Southern Quebec, there's other refining and mining that's happening. So it's just, you can see the extent of mining that happens and metal and mineral extraction from the earth in, in Canada. It's fairly extensive. Again, $50 billion a year in, is part of our economy based on mining of minerals and metals. So now you can do the check your understanding questions on page 176. And that covers our lesson 21 today, which is Canada's natural resources. So remember, we talked about the renewable natural resources of fisheries, wildlife, forests, and water and then also the non-renewable resources of fossil fuels and minerals and metals. So you can explain the economic benefit of both renewable and non-renewable resources, natural resources, and you can think critically about sustainable use of natural resources. So this is just how the lesson, this lesson primary focuses on the economic benefits. So we're really talking about financial wealth. We're talking about how we can extract and take from the land and what this means for us in a capitalist system that is based on money being the most valuable thing, the most important thing. And this is really something that you want to think critically about in terms of how does this make our world function, our world being a capitalist system where we are constantly fighting for money 
which is arbitrary paper and coins or arbitrary numbers, digital numbers in a virtual system of your, it's just kind of boggles your mind in terms of how much importance is put on this and therefore the amount of extraction that we take to the earth. We have so much, Canada has a huge amount of natural resources, which the is really the foundation of our economical wealth. Um, it's why historically places around the world have come to colonize, have come to extract the, the rich natural resources here. Um, and it's how the, the detrimental effects of colonialism, colonization, and uh, <laughs> very, like it, it's the foundation of the amount of racism and discrimination and oppression that happens here in Canada um, and has historically happened is because of the wealth of natural resources, the, the amount, the abundance of natural resources that we have in Canada is the basis of why uh, colonization happened and that has had rippled effects. So it's just a really interesting lesson to think about is yes, knowing the natural resources, both the renewable and non-renewable resources that are here in Canada, but focusing it solely as economic benefit is such a colonial Eurocentric perspective, um, which is really problematic. And really, if we continue to only talk about these things as financial benefits, then we are never going to learn how to be sustainable and how to be respectful of the earth um, as a holistic society. There's elements um, and different indigenous cultures and individuals are respectful in different ways, but as a whole society, as a Canadian society, we are not. Um, and I would think of indigenous communities outside of that Canadian society as this is just a different way of life and a different perspective. And the Canadian society's perspective as a whole I subscribe to this capitalist colonialist view of resources. And that is heartbreaking. Anyway, that is my ramble and my rant. Um, but it's just something to think about in terms of the context of this lesson. We, the, your book doesn't really talk about it. The key questions don't really talk about it, but it's something to reflect upon and to, to, to talk about in your communities and uh, outside of your communities. So you can do the review questions now on page 177. Um, and that is our lesson for today. So that is lesson 21. If you have any questions, if you want to have a further conversation about sustainability and about uh, the about colonization and extracting resources from the land, uh, feel free to reach out and chat with me. I'm happy to have a conversation about this further. You can call me either locally at the number 807-737-1488 or the long distance number, or sorry, the toll-free number at 1-800-667-3703. My extension is 2209, so I'm always happy to chat. If you want to talk to John about just about the direct course material and the questions, uh, he can be reached at the same numbers, but his extension is 2210. You can also email us. My email address is bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. John's email address is J-S-T-R-A-D-I-O-T-T-O -T -T at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can also connect to my YouTube channel, B Slate Wassa, where all of our lessons are uploaded uh, after broadcasting, so you can access both today's lesson as well as all of our past lessons at the playlist is called SVN3E, which is our course code. So that's a really useful resource if you'd like to go over a past material. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day and you learned something today. Magwitch!